It's not only news, it's science breakthroughs. Tomorrow's technologies. Advanced medical techniques. It's a glimpse into the future where we discuss artificial intelligence, earth and energy, enhanced humans, future society, health and medicine, space, robots and machines. Welcome to Science Bites with Joe and Craig. Today is Thursday, July 23rd, 2020. James Webb was an American government official who served as the second appointed administrator of NASA from February 14, 1961 to October 7, 1968. Webb oversaw NASA from the beginning of the Kennedy administration through the end of the Johnson administration, overseeing all the critical first man launches in the Mercury through Gemini NASA programs. In 2002, the Next Generation Space Telescope was named the James Webb Space Telescope. The telescope is the largest and most technically complex space science telescope NASA has ever built. It's an international collaboration between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. The development of the orbital spyglass began in 1996 with an initial launch planned in 2007. Now, after a slew of significant redesigns, countless delays, and budget overturns, NASA is tentatively eyeing a March 2021 launch. The space agency will reevaluate launch readiness later this month. The 21-foot telescope will observe distant space orbiting the sun instead of the Earth at the distance called Lagrange Point, which will keep the same pace with the Earth. An origami-like sun shield the size of a tennis court will help keep it cool. The iconic 18-hexagonal mirror segment, each over 4 feet in diameter, will be closed during launch and then open like a flower once in space. The gigantic reflector spans an area of 25.4 square meters or 273 square feet. The mirrors are built from lightweight yet resilient beryllium. Beryllium is a relatively rare element in the universe, usually occurring as a product of the breakup of larger atomic nuclei that have collided with cosmic rays. It is a divalent element which occurs naturally only in combination with other elements and minerals. Notable gemstones that contain beryllium include aquamarine and emerald. The telescope will be collecting valuable data using four scientific instruments, including cameras and spectrometers, to find out more about the earliest galaxies formed shortly after the Big Bang. Also observe the early life cycles of stars as they form and evolve. What Joe just said needs some explaining, because we don't have a time machine, so how could we possibly see how the earliest galaxies formed? Well, imagine light leaving the first stars and galaxies nearly 13.6 billion years ago and traveling through space and time to reach our telescopes. So what we see right now really happened 13.6 billion years ago. Light does not stay constant when it's traveling this long. By the time the light reaches us, its color or wavelength has shifted towards the red, or something we call red shift. When we talk about very distant objects, Einstein's general relativity comes into play. It tells us that the expansion of the universe means it is space between objects that actually stretches, causing galaxies to move away from each other. Furthermore, any light in that space will also stretch, shifting the light's wavelength to longer wavelengths. This can make distant objects very dim or invisible at visible wavelengths of light because light reaches us as infrared light. For very high redshifts, like the furthest objects from us, the visible light is generally shifted into the near and mid infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. For that reason, to see the first stars and galaxies, we need a powerful near and mid infrared telescope, which is precisely what the James Webb Telescope is. Another goal will be to take the temperature and investigate the chemical properties of the planetary systems to examine if life can survive in those systems. The longer wavelengths enable Webb to look inside dust clouds where stars and planetary systems are forming today. It will be the first time in our history where we can peer through dense hot clouds of forming galaxies to see what is happening and how it's happening. 
the James Webb Space Telescope is going to change everything we thought we knew and confirm many of scientific theories. You know, Joe, I can't wait to see what this is going to show us. Just look at how much the Hubble Space Telescope changed everything we knew about space. This is going to be a major breakthrough. I think we're going to get a lot of data from this. I do, too. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we'll be discussing a new gene editing technique. What makes a rainbow bend? Where does the universe end? To know the world from A to Z. Discover science and technology. Where is the dinosaur? What's on the ocean floor? To know the world from A to Z. Astronomy, biology. sun so warm? What makes a winter storm? And what's a quadruped? Why is the planet Mars red? You'll find there's lots to know. And exploring as you go. To know the world from A to Z. Discover science and A public service message from the National Science Foundation. Welcome back to the show. We have all heard of the game-changing tech called CRISPR. Now a new genome editing tool brings together two halves of bacterial toxin at target points on the DNA double helix to fix mutations. In a biological beating of swords into plowshares, researchers have converted a bacterial toxin into a genome editing tool that can make precise changes to DNA in the mitochondria. Mitochondria are specialized structures unique to the cells of animals, plants, and fungi. The part of the DNA serves as batteries powering various functions of the cell and the organisms as a whole. Although mitochondria are a vital part of the cell, evidence shows that they evolve from primitive bacteria. These rare conditions, which include Leber hereditary, optic neuropathy, and lethal infantile cardiomyopathy, collectively affect about 1 in 4,000 people. Research on these illnesses has been foiled in part because there was no way of reproducing the mutations in strains of mice. Thousands of mitochondria exist in almost every human cell, and each contains its own genes. Researchers have made little headway correcting the genetic defects that lead to mitochondrial diseases, many of which are caused by point mutations. In such mutations, a single DNA base is replaced by one that disrupts a needed protein or otherwise impairs the power plant. One difficulty is that a key component of the most famous genome editor, CRISPR, is too large to enter mitochondria. And other genome editors that can reach mtDNA do not have the sensitivity to correct point mutations. To create the new tool, a team of researchers had combined the feature of CRISPR and an older technology called transcription activator-like effectors. The group studied how bacteria secrete toxins to kill other bacteria. In 2018, researchers stumbled on a bacteria toxin that helps catalyze the conversion of cytosine into uracil. This base is normal in RNA, but in DNA, it naturally converts into thymine. What's more, the toxin creates this mutation on both strands of the DNA double helix, something never seen before. Previous gene editors were able to break the double-stranded DNA of mitochondria, destroying them. That has the potential to treat some diseases. It cannot correct mtDNA point mutations. That is where the new tech comes into play. In experiments with human cells, the conversion of cytosine to thymine occurred up to 50% of the time. Importantly, they did not find a significant number of off-target edits, which potentially can cause serious harm. Researchers also hope to improve editing efficiency and reduce off-target edits so that mtDNA-based editing can eventually be tested in humans. CRISPR-Cas9 burst onto the scientific scene with the publication of a breakthrough paper in October 2012. That invention changed medicine and biology. This new technique will transform our world in ways we simply cannot imagine. We're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we'll have a quick bite for you about cataract surgery. Fifty years ago, 
we went to the moon. We called it Apollo. What many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon. As a new generation of explorers, this time to stay. And to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we will discover life-saving, earth-changing science. And that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wondered if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go. We're back for our quick bite. Cataracts are the clouding of your lenses of the eye, which is a natural part of our aging process. Today, cataract removal is one of the most common surgeries performed and one of the safest and most effective operations. A few years ago, I had cataract surgery performed and lens implants put in. While I was having this done, Craig was outside there researching the first cataract surgery. The first cataract surgery was described in a textbook written by an Indian physician who lived on the banks of the Ganges River around 1000 BC. The method he used was called couching, consisted of using a needle or thorn to push the clouded lens downwards into the eye, displacing the clouded white cataract to clear the visual access. Once the patient claimed that he or she could see clearly, the couching stopped. The method had terrible results with only about 30% success rate. And I don't know about you, Joe, but if somebody's coming at my eyeball with a thorn, I am not staying there. Yeah, uh-uh. right. No way. Well, I can't even imagine that. No. <clears throat> well, in the early part of the 20th century, cataract surgery patients were giving anesthesia and sometimes cocaine. That's how they handled it, right? <laughs> And then the cataract was removed through an incision. A liquid irrigation was used to remove the cataract, and then the incision was stitched shut. I don't know. That's just that still sounds scary to I me. I know. Ugh. But they gave you cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how they kept people still when they were high as a kite. Yeah, right. The surgery lasted for hours, and patients had to lie flat and keep their heads immobilized for two weeks. Talk about inconvenient. Yeah. Once they healed from surgery, they had to wear thick glasses that replaced their removed lenses. You know, it only took five minutes for my I know. process. <laughs> it, well, a total of a half hour, but only five minutes for five minutes. surgery. Yep. In 1949, Harold Ridley implanted the first intraocular lens. He was also the inventor of the intraocular lens, which made him a pioneer in the emergent biomedical engineering field and paved the way for more developments in implanted medical devices. Here is a really interesting fact. During World War II, Ridley noted that when shards of acrylic from aircraft cockpit windows became lodged in pilots' eyes, inflammatory rejection did not occur. But in regular glass accidents, inflammatory rejection did occur. Since the eyes don't react to acrylic, making intraocular implants of acrylic became the solution to successful cataract surgery. I think that's pretty cool. It is. And you know, Greg, finally, patients no longer need to have Coke bottle thick glasses. The first foldable lenses were used in 1978, and the foldable lenses could fit inside the small incisions. In 2009, laser cataract surgery began. It is a bladeless procedure that uses a computer to create a three-dimensional map of the eye, and using that map, the computer-aided device precisely removes the cataract and suctions it out. Laser cataract surgery theoretically allows specific steps of cataract surgery to be done more accurately. Today, cataract surgery is performed under local anesthesia and also correct refractive errors. That means nearsightedness and farsightedness can be corrected with multifocal lenses. That brings us to a close of another show. You can find all our past shows on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Alexa, Spotify, and many other platforms. Or just visit our website, MyScienceBites.com. Joe and I are grateful to you, our listeners, for sharing our podcast with your family and friends. If you're new to the show, please subscribe or follow. It really helps move up our ratings so more people can find us. 
Thanks again for listening, and we'll be back next week.